Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, with this video, we're going to start talking about Nietzsche, a very well-known, perhaps often infamous uh, philosopher um, of the late 19th century. Uh, we are going to be looking at some early and some middle period writings uh, from him. Um, the Greek State and Homer's Contest, a couple of short essays, and then we're going to read um, uh, uh, a redacted version of On Truth and Lies in a, in a non-moral or extra-moral sense. And then we're going to read a, a small selection of aphorisms from his work, The Gay Science. Um, so what, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin by just sort of saying a few things about Nietzsche generally, and then we'll jump right into the Greek state. Uh, we're using this uh, text, the Nietzsche Reader. Um, there's other readers. Uh, this one just has a, a nice sort of assortment of early, middle, late, and sort of you know um, rare or rarely collected um, works by him. Uh, in any case, Nietzsche was um, by training a classical philologist uh, to someone who studies um, ancient Greek and Latin, who is familiar with the history and culture of Greece and Rome, uh, familiar with their um, artistic and architectural developments, um, and with you know their 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 intellectual history, their philosophies. Um, he, he is someone who comes from a religious family, a long line of ministers, um, and that is something that early on uh, he was going to pursue, but uh, through his education and through his own sort of you know, soul searching, um, he ended up you know, choosing this, this path of uh, the study um, of the ancients. Um, Nietzsche is someone who people tend to fall in love with, or they just maybe know him by reputation and, and, and don't care for him. Um, or maybe they read him and they don't care for him. That, that's certainly possible too. But generally, even the people that don't care for Nietzsche do find um, you know, a lot of pleasure in reading him. He's very, um, he's very provocative. He has, um, a, he's a wonderful writer. Uh, he's powerful. He can be very funny, um, and his criticism is uh, well, it's it's quite cutting, um, as criticism should be. Um, so, Nietzsche, Nietzsche is someone who did not get into philosophy uh, directly; that he rather sort of pivoted uh, in his career. Um, he was a bit of a, a prodigy, uh, you know, when it when it comes to learning. He was, a, he was a great student in most subjects, not all subjects. Um, and he was also very artistic. Uh, you know, he, he, um, he, he was very talented um, musically and uh, also wrote some poetry. Um, and his works are very creative as well. You know, he doesn't really do systematic philosophy. Uh, there are, there are his, his, earliest sort of major work, The Birth of Tragedy, um, is, is perhaps one of his more systematic works. But sort of as he develops, he gets away from doing that kind of philosophy, and he's much uh, more well-known perhaps for his aphoristic style, um, aphorisms being these sort of like short, self-contained bits of writing um, that, that almost, almost read like fragments. Um, uh, and they're, and, you know, they can sort of have a sort of axiomatic quality, or they can have a sort of like sayings quality. But, but they, they can also have a lot of potential for just really creative um, approaches to tackling um, a topic without, without a lot of, you know, a lot of introduction. He just sort of will get in there and say what it is that he wants to say. And so, the handful of aphorisms that we're reading at the tail end of these, uh, uh, of this, of this. Um, you know, component of the course uh, should should you know demonstrate that fairly well. Um, so Nietzsche, in being a classical philologist and not sort of 
being a, a regular philosopher. Um, this, and, and he's not alone in this, even regular, <laughs> regular philosophers do this. Um, much of what he has to say comes, comes by way of his knowledge and appreciation and his criticism um, of the Greeks. Nietzsche is someone who believed that the the early Greeks, you know, sort of sort of prior to the the decadence that is um, going to be found, you know, sort of Socrates and after, um, that that the really powerful culturally, um, you know, culturally significant and not just significant but um, vital uh, culturally vital forces in nature in in play through through the through the ancient Greeks ideas about the world the their um, you know their 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 institutions um, their way of life how they how they saw the world and were in the world before it became overly rationalized with the birth of sort of philosophy proper so I mean Nietzsche is much more um, someone who appreciates the pre-Socratic philosophers because of the blend of um, their creativity and their intuition um, and their ability to not make everything they say sort of subject to a, a, a rigid sort of uh, rationality, um, which he believes sort of drains out the sort of sensuous and vital force of, uh, of, of a good philosophy or having something, you know, uh, useful or interesting or powerful to say. He's not anti-reason, uh, but he definitely feels that we're leaning way too heavily towards, uh, towards, our, uh, particu towards our particular conception of what reason is and towards rationality and rational systems. And that, that'll come out a little bit more in the, the stuff that we're looking at. Um, Nietzsche is someone who, if you have, up until this point of the course, if you really enjoyed Plato, um, and you love the sort of elegant view of the world, the, the, the sort of life of the mind that he puts forward in sort of his, you know, the platonic metaphysics, as it were, you know, these timeless ideals of justice and truth and beauty and so forth um you know Nietzsche is going to tear all that down that Nietzsche is someone who very much views himself as uh taking the western philosophical tradition um in any metaphysical tradition uh to task um that we have allowed certain um speculative um ideas to take possession of us and sort of find their way into our consciousness. And now we don't have healthy ideas about, you know, what it even means to be a human being, how to view our own existence, how to view the world and our institutions are thus, you know, reflections of that. But then because we participate in them and we're raised in those institutions, you know, educational institutions, religious institutions, political institutions, whatever, um, that these things like, raise up generation upon generation that just, you know, works its way into the way that we understand the world and our, and our biases and assumptions. And Nietzsche, like Emerson, and Nietzsche was a, was a big reader uh, of Emerson. Emerson had a really big impact on him. Um, I, I would say the pre-Socratics, um, Schopenhauer, if you've heard of Schopenhauer, and Emerson were some of the, the really big influences on, on his thinking. Um, you know, a case could be made for, you know, other influences, but, but I, I, I certainly see those and, um, uh, and Wagner uh, as well, uh, problematically. And it's not as though any of the people that had an influence on his thought that it wasn't somehow problematic. You know, Nietzsche had very little pure appreciation for anyone. There was, there was always a, a, a attention of sorts. Um, but it didn't seem to be so with Emerson. There wasn't, there wasn't as much, um, you know, sort of as he developed that the love affair that he had with Emerson's essays, 
um, never really seem to uh, diminish. And so if in reading this, uh, you see aspects of Emerson, um, you know, I think you're onto something. Um, the difference is, is that Emerson always comes off very optimistic, uh, even if you're aware that everything that he's saying isn't entirely optimistic. Whereas with Nietzsche, you'll never really get some impression that he's uh, some sort of like optimist. Um, he's sort of, he, he's, he's wanting to tear down illusions. Um, and again, that's what some, that's what endears him to some people and other people can't handle it. Um, you know, I'll leave it, I'll leave it to you and your temperaments and your sort of intellectual honesty, uh, in terms of how it strikes you. Um, but it is nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, uh, can be quite enjoyable, uh, ride, you know, to, to really sort of give yourself over to some of his writing and see where it takes you. <laughs> Um, so I want to say a few more things about some concepts that are uh, associated with uh, Nietzsche, some of which we'll explore more than others, but just so you have some, some like working ideas of um, concepts that are often talked about when one, um, you know, is, is discussing Nietzsche, thinking about Nietzsche, reading Nietzsche's work. So um, the first four sort of big concepts, and these aren't the only concepts, there's other ones, but these are just ones that I think that you should in particular um, be alerted to, you know, they're, um, they're some of the most important. Um, the first is the Ubermensch. Probably a lot of you have, you know, heard of the Ubermensch, sometimes translated as the Superman or the Overman. Um, you know, uh, a, perhaps a better translation uh, would be the trans man, which, you know, clearly in the time in which uh, we live would carry a different connotation, but a, a sort of literal understanding of what Nietzsche, what you know, what what Ubermensch means and can signify in terms of how Nietzsche describes it. Um, I, I think that the sort of person in transition might might be the better um, way of, of of understanding it. But nevertheless, the idea is that the the overman, the superman, the trans man is, uh, or person, is one who is rising above, um, you know, convention and conformity, above the herd, above the masses, and is attempting to engage in the creation of new values, that people see the world a particular way, and it's one in which is generally a view of the world is shared by, you know, other people in the community or within groups or, you know, uh, sort of, sort of like subcultures within culture, perhaps we might say now. Um, and that the, the, the Ubermensch is someone who is going to go a different way. They're going to create their own values, that they realize that values aren't these static set things that they are in fact things that are uh, created. And, and this, 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 this will play into, you know, I think I used the designation of dangerous philosopher with Emerson, and you could definitely use that designation, um, you know, with Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a, a much more aristocratic philosopher in the sense that he's really only speaking to, you know, a small group of people, people that are intellectually, um, creatively talented, that the vast majority of society doesn't really know what to do with uh, what, what Nietzsche is, is saying. Um, that, you know, they're, they're way too committed, um, maybe too afraid. Um, and that's obviously putting it uh, not, not particularly charitably. Um, but nevertheless, the view would be that uh, most people don't have the time, the talent, uh, the courage to even undertake such a task. And so there's you know, it's very few people could sort of aspire to this. If, if one can even by will want to be one, it might be one of those things where it's not that someone's choosing to be an Ubermensch per se, but it's just that that's, that's sort of what's expressing itself in, in, in them, um, you know, doing their utmost to be who they are. Um, 
you know, a good visual for the Ubermensches um, comes from the, the prologue to Nietzsche's work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, in which there's a tightrope dancer, and the tightrope dancer is up, you know, on that, on that, 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 that wire, right, and the, and sort of, um, between two ends, right, out, out there, keep, keeping his balance going from, let's say, one tower to another tower, right, and, you know, then, so the line is strung between these two towers, and one tower represents the past, and one tower represents the future, and so the Ubermensch, the tightrope dancer, if we went with this, you know, uh, this, this sort of image, um, doesn't have the security of the tower of the past to sort of live in old values and, you know, in the sort of psychological or spiritual or even physical sort of safety that that sort of provides one and just doing the way things have always done it. Nor does he have the security of having arrived at the future in which it's a, you know, a new and a changed world. Um, instead, he's, he's in the midst and he's underway. He, he's, he's in the most dangerous of positions because he's leaving behind how things have always been, but he hasn't yet arrived to the way that things are going to be. Um, and so the, the risk of his course that they can fail, that, 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 there's a real chance of failure, and that failure results, you know, obviously, um, in death, right? And this death could, I mean, it could be literal, but it, it, it could more than likely mean um, a sort of um, existential despair or uh, a sense of alienation or exaggerated sense of alienation or despair, more so than perhaps, you know, what, what everyone else is experiencing. Um, you know, just just some some form of um, failure or loss that's uh, really devastating that, that perhaps because other people don't venture as much in such things as creating a value system you know that they never they never lose anything um, whereas you know the Ubermensch perhaps um, goes all in so to speak um, so another another uh, popular uh, concept or idea associated with Nietzsche's thought is will to power um, will to power is uh, Nietzsche's idea for what predominates the universe, and that is that everything is will to power. That there's there's no there's no way of understanding the phenomenon um, um, of life, let's say in particular, uh, without understanding it as the 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 assertion of power. It's it's it's, it's you know whether or not whether whatever we make of consciousness, um, that it is not something that somehow can do away with it. Um, that this is happening at a vegetative level. This is happening at a biological level. This is happening at just like the way things are. Is that things want to be? Um, you go out to a massive. You go out to the parking lot, and there's just you know like acres of concrete. If there's one crack in the concrete, you'll see life, like weeds or grass, like making their way up there, like inevitably. That, that, that all throughout nature, phenomena um, are within this sort of, you know, uh, within this understanding of the universe. And for Nietzsche, for Nietzsche, this isn't, this isn't even like a philosophical argument. Like for Nietzsche, this is just, this is just an accurate description of reality, that all life is not only preserving itself and trying to survive, that it's actually trying to assert its power. Like you could, you could understand, you know, eating habits, procreative habits, um, how societies organize themselves, right? Um, any of this is, is the predominance and the expression of power. And Nietzsche is a philosopher of power, right? He's not only an aristocratic philosopher and a sort of "quote unquote" dangerous philosopher in, in that sense. He he is a philosopher of power, and that is one of the reasons that he appreciates the ancient Greeks is that they understood that the expression of human powers, hum, human powers of speech, human powers of thought, um, human powers of you know uh, physicality, um, of the dominance of uh, one culture or way of life over another, that that these things were just uh, the way the things are, and that the denial of those, the denial of those things, 
um, have really long-term negative uh, psychological and spiritual effects upon us. Um, that, that we can become an unhealthy and ultimately nihilistic culture. You know, Nietzsche is often associated with nihilism, and, you know, Nietzsche is really not a nihilist. Um, he, and I'll, I'll make, a, I'll make a, a bit of a distinction here. If, if, if the phrase positive nihilist even means anything, um, it would be that Nietzsche feels that the underlying meaninglessness of, of existence uh, ought to be met with the um, affirmation of life and that one has to live life in a way that affirms it. Because to rest on a default position that it already means something, that it's already significant, that it's already dignified. Um, for Nietzsche, that that, that culminates in um, not only a nihilistic sort of, you know, in, individual sense of you know, self or unhealthy psyche, um, but in a whole host of like really, um, really terrible sort of uh, pathologies, if you will, neuroses perhaps, um, that that culturally it leads to a form of nihilism, you know, and, and this is how he really, this is the direction that he saw the Western world go. Um, you know, they rested in too much illusion and too much sort of unhelpful and unhealthy um, ideas about how humans should be and behave and what like inherent orders to things and the, like inherent essences to things and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so will to power is a way of sort of expressing the way things really are. And if you're worried that Nietzsche is somehow inhumane, I mean, he's not. Uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche definitely, I mean, he was someone who was capable of love and of charity and civility. And he didn't, he didn't despise those things. He didn't despise compassion. Um, but what he, what he what he saw is un, un, unhelpful, is a and unhealthy, is a is a culture and in the, in the you know thus people that rested upon metaphysical assumptions about the universe, that there is truth with a capital T, that there's a God, that there's you know a, a way that morality has to be, um, that you know this particular form of government or this particular form of government um, that has these uh, liberal, neoliberal, communistic, um, you know, um, fascist maybe. <laughs> we'll have to parse that out a little bit. Um, I'll, try to, I'll, try to, I'll try to lay out his politics a little bit more clearly uh, and what, what's to come, although it, it, it won't be satisfactory. Um, I'll just say that in advance. But that, you know, he he is critical of that of that of those assumptions about the world in which we live or the structure that that undergirds it, um, and it and what it leads to is, you know, people who who think that they're being really moral are actually always engaged in acts and in, in like resentful acts of revenge, um, you know the like the whole idea behind Southern hospitality, like, oh, bless your heart, right? That, that so much condescension um, is contained in most of our acts of, you know, seeming kindness, that it's not even really genuine. And that people are, whether it's their views of the afterlife or their view of like a sort of cosmic balance, of, you know, maybe it's karma, maybe it's, um, maybe it's, you know, good people going to the good place and bad people going to the bad place. Um, you know, maybe it's just in the enacted moment of uh, moral or ethical decisions that usually the, the, the complex psychology at work there is one in which those people really aren't being what they think that they're being. They're, they're, they're actually just demonstrating um, a variation of will to power, and they're using morality as the means of expressing that power in a societally acceptable way. Um, and, and in fact, they're probably less moral, you know, when they're making their moral judgments um, than those that they think that they're making those judgments against. Um, in any case, a couple more things. Nietzsche talks about um, 
the uh, reevaluation of all values, um, you know, which you can kind of already, since talking about the evil mention, talking about the will to power, um, you can already kind of get a sense of this. And that is that, you know, for him, the philosophical project, uh, broadly construed, is one in which he's he's attempting, and he's a attempting to sort of, you know, um, demonstrate a way in which, uh, or inspire others to um, undertake this project of, let's reevaluate all these values that we have, all the all these things that we use as the um, the basis for making determinations about what's preferable, desirable, good, um, or you know, bad, um, th and this and this gets into what how we live our lives and what we pursue and you know what it is that uh, that what we aspire to and you know um, what we try to avoid and what we try to go towards, and that we just have to revalue like all values that that it's so. It's so based upon like you know history's march towards um, th this this ultimate sort of conception of modernity of process uh, process of you know like progress um, and and what it is that people believe we're marching towards and and why that's so important. Uh, Nietzsche thinks it has to like for the most part uh, be reconsidered. Um, again, it's not as though Nietzsche doesn't like nice things <laughs> and whatever nice things might come out of uh, contemporary society. It's not that. Um, it's just that the, the value systems of modernity, the biases of modernity, uh, in his estimation, are in need of serious critique. And again, perhaps some of this will come out you know, as, we, as we read through these works. Um, his, his biggest teaching, this is perhaps point number four of the his major ideas is um, the uh, eternal return or eternal recurrence, uh, eternal return of the same. It's, there's a few different uh, variations of it, but the idea is um, in the last aphorism that you're looking at, will we'll give us an opportunity to talk about this is that instead of thinking of the world as uh, the universe as having like a beginning, and, and then a bunch of stuff happens and then it's like an, an end. So either in a sort of cosmic sense or in your life, like that your life is like, you know, you're born, you live, you die, and either like you just die or, you know, you die and then like you go on to some other state of existence or whatever. Um, that Nietzsche uses this, this, this ancient idea of the eternal return. And that is that everything is part of this like cycle um, in which Everything that is born and everything that dies will be reborn um, and will die again, so on and so forth. Um, you know, in one sense, if we read it um, somewhat, some, somewhat literally, of course, um, I think it means that Nietzsche is tapping into a sort of life cycle that we find in, in nature. And that is, you know, flowers come into bloom. They die, you know, the weather changes, they go away, the flowers come back. And so in a sense, humans operate under a sort of delusion of individuality um, in which they think that they're special, right? You're you and you've got all these important ideas and feelings. Um, and so like your death really, really matters to you. Um, and ergo your life does. And so what Nietzsche is saying is like, you know, like, like all the other animals out there or the plant life or whatever else, things come into being, they pass out of being, and then they come back into being. And it's just part of this life cycle. And you need to sort of get over yourself, uh, as it were, and just recognize that you're just another iteration, another sort of, you know, variant expression of the same thing. Uh, just another human being and a whole history of people being born and dying. Um, and then, on and then, in another sense, perhaps not as you know, st strictly adhering to that concept, uh, that perhaps it's just a thought project. Perhaps Nietzsche's I Nietzsche's idea of the eternal return is a way to help us break out of old and helpful ways of viewing our life and our world in terms of causality, and in terms of metaphysical destinies, or in terms of a, a, a you know a nihilistic destination of nothingness, right? 
that it is a, it's an alternative way to view the world that might open up some new possibilities um, for the, the overall project of creating values. Um, so definitely, you know, uh, mark those ideas and think about those and try to spot them as you find them. I'll mention a couple of other things. Um, he's really well known for uh, his remarks about the death of God, which we you know made some comments about when we read Emerson. And we'll explore that more when we read Aphorism 125 from the Gay Science. Um, he is also known for um, master and slave uh, morality. Um, and that is the idea that uh, basically morals are for the herd, that morals are for, you know, the, the masses of people um, that, that basically uh, are subject to the few. Um, that the masters sort of create what, what is morality and it serves their interests and that everyone else has to follow the rules. Um, and that's a really sort of simple way of, 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 of stating it, but that's, that's more or less the power dynamic, that morals are never really about morals, that, that morals are really about the power dynamic that exists between um, the people that are strong, that have wealth, that have influence, and then the people that don't. Um, and that the way of life that you might find in any given place, any given society, um, is something that uh, does not generally or genuinely um, reflect the best interests of the citizens at large, um, but of whoever it is that has power within that society. Perhaps it's corporations, perhaps it's, um, you know, in, in the old world, it would have been, you know, monarchies and nobles, and, you know, now it would be, you know, um, you know p political uh, and, and cultural uh, elites, as it were. Um, so yeah, morality is a bit, a bit more of a power game than anything else. And then uh, another concept um, is a morfati, a morfati, um, to love fate or to love your fate, to love one's own fate, something like that. Um, which we'll have to try to unpack that a little bit. Um, Maybe we'll try to do that later, but the short version of it would be something like you, um, I mean, most obviously, you didn't ask to be born, <laughs> and you didn't ask for uh, the particular uh, array of talents and uh, limitations that you have. Um, you know, you're born into a situation, and there's all sorts of... Uh, there's all sorts of societal and cultural factors going on. You, there's a history behind you already. Or you didn't author it. You didn't participate in it. Um, there's all sorts of things going on in the wider world. It's not anything that you caused or, you know, that, that, that you resisted or didn't resist. Or by doing this or doing this, you didn't make it happen. But nevertheless, here you are and you're living this life. And so do, do you hate your life? Do you hate, do you hate, do you hate your fate? Um, do you resent it? Uh, is your life defined by your resistance to and your resentment of um, the various um, fabrics which uh, compose the tapestry of your life? Or, or are you well disposed towards your life? Are you well disposed towards your talents and your limitations? And who your family is and the friend group you find yourself in and um, what's going on in your society? Which doesn't mean you have to agree with stuff or disagree with stuff. That, that's not the point. Uh, the point is, is that are you well disposed to live the life that has been allotted to you? Because again, you didn't, you didn't uh, select it. You have a, you have an array of options. You've got a, you've got, you know, you've got a, you've got some decisions to make, of course, right? Um, but are you going to be making these decisions from, uh, from a deficit um, or from an excess um, of enthusiasm for your own life, right? And so, a morphati can be a very powerful way of approaching philosophy. Um, so I was going to start talking about the Greek state with this video, but uh, we'll just we'll just sort of call this the, you know, warm up to reading Nietzsche. And so when I come back, what I'm what I'm going to try to do is cover the Greek state with a video, then cover Homer's contest with a video, and then I'll probably do um, one or two videos uh, for um, on truth and lies, and then perhaps one just on the aphorism. So. Um, we'll get we'll get everything covered. You'll just have to you know make the make the time to to check this stuff out. All right. So until then, uh, keep reading and keep thinking, and I'll uh, see you soon.